Watson. Um, his sister is battling uh, a type of cancer that is very progressive, and they have not given them, uh, given her that much time. Uh, they say days to weeks. So definitely want to remember that family, if you would. Um, they left right after Sunday school. Got a lot of people that are hurting right now, and I know that we definitely want to remember each one, each family. Um, I have uh, had a funeral yesterday, and and I, what is what is so sad is we're, we're losing so many great men and women from such a great group of people. He was 94 years old, and uh, man, we're we're losing a, a, a wonderful group and. I tell you guys, I challenge y'all all the time, especially you younger people, go hang out with these folks. They have, they have gone through life. They, they know what it is to fight battles. They know what it is to do things with integrity. Um, go hang out with this older generation. They, they are, are good folks who you can learn a lot from. And instead of looking at how the rest of the world raises children and lives life, go back to a great generation and look at how they live and respond in life, and it'll bless your heart, really will. So today uh, will probably be our last day in the book of Esther, and we're going to be in Esther chapter 9, but before we turn there, uh, Stephen Davey uh, shares a story in his commentary on the book of Esther. It says uh, that he heard a story about a guy who was bitten by a dog and rushed to the hospital. Time lapsed as both man and dog were tested. The doctor came in with the grim news that the dog was rabid and the man would likely develop rabies. There was great silence, no response except for the man simply taking a pad of paper and writing feverishly upon the paper. His doctor, thinking that he was writing out his last will and testament, encouraged him by saying, listen, you're not going to die. There's a cure for rabies. This man said, I'm not worried about that. He said, I'm writing down a list of people I want to go and bite. Okay? So, yeah. And that's the way the world is. Don't get mad, get even. Bite back. One of mankind's natural instincts is revenge. While you might not use a gun or a sword, perhaps you've used a phone call or an email The enemy of your soul knows that you will remain a victim much longer if you retaliate. Bitterness and anger will only steal your joy. You'll never find satisfaction in the destruction of an enemy. That all from Stephen Davey, all that he shared there in his commentary. And I thought, wow, how fitting for us this morning as we look at this world, as we battle out uh, our lives Every day in this war that we live, we need to learn to do it with integrity. Integrity. There's a way to fight. There's a way to defend yourself, but it must be done with integrity. And we're going to look at this this morning and kind of walk our way through it. So if you would stand with us as we read from Esther chapter 9. Verse 1 says, now the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day when the king's command and edict were to be put into effect, on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it turned out to the contrary, so that the Jews themselves gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout the provinces of King Assyrius to attack those who sought to harm them. And no one could stand against them because the dread of them had fallen on all the people. Even all the officials, the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who were doing the king's business were supporting the Jews because the, uh, the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and the news about him spread throughout the provinces. For the man Mordecai became greater and greater. So the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying, and they did as they pleased to those who hated them. At the citadel in Susa, the Jews killed and and eliminated 500 men. Then he goes on to give a list of those, including the 10 sons of Haman, uh, the son of Hamadatha, the, the Jews' enemy, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. 
Father, we thank you that we can see that defending ourselves, standing up for ourselves is part of the daily life, but it's how we do it. It's how we do our battles that really matter. Lord God, may we understand that just because we can completely destroy someone with the truth doesn't mean that that's what we should be about. Instead, Father, leave room for wrath that comes from you. We will look at this, Father, I know as we study the scripture, but Father, I just pray that we will be men and women who, who take care of ourselves when it comes to defending ourselves with great integrity, Lord. In Christ's name I pray, amen. A lot of times in life when someone hurts us, our first response is to hurt back. As a matter of fact, our first true response is not just to hurt someone back, uh, but to actually do worse to them than what they have done to us. But if you actually really pay attention, a man who is full of integrity does not go around trying to defend himself by, by putting his enemy down, but instead his integrity speaks for itself, and he knows that as people listen to gossip and they listen to these things that are being said about them, hurtful things, hateful things. He knows that his integrity is intact and that people who truly know him will know that those things are lies. That's the key though is integrity. We got to start out with integrity in order to have integrity in battle. So our integrity must be there. We must be men and women who are full of integrity, men and women who can be trusted, men and women whose words are good. And and when we say we're going to do something, we do it. Um, That is important as believers and Christians. And in order for us to handle those who do not like us, those who would come against us, in order for us to handle them properly, it starts with integrity. It starts with us already having that in place. So the first thing this morning is you must ask yourself, as a believer, do you have good integrity? How would people speak of your name if it came up in public? How would people talk about you if your name came up in, in a discussion? How would people describe you? For me as a pastor, how would people describe how I care for my flock? How would they describe how I preach my messages? How would they describe how I treat my family? How would they describe how I treat my friends? Integrity is the key to being able to to walk through life as a good example. People are not going to sit and listen to someone who does not have integrity. One of the things I've learned about a lot of the men and women who are incarcerated, a lot of them, even though they didn't have a father, they were uh, in church. A lot of them were in church already. And I said uh, to, to many of them, I've asked this question, and they've said they've returned the same exact answer to me. What caused you to leave the church? And they said it was the pastors and the way that they lived their life in church on Sunday. And then we saw them outside of church. And it was totally different. So integrity starts at the top, and then it should bleed down throughout the church. But the believer... Folks, you are being watched. You are being looked at. And if you believe that just by taking your children to church and then living as though you're headed to hell the rest of the week is going to fix your child, I'm going to tell you, your child is watching you, and they see that you lack integrity. So integrity is the key to walking faithfully. Integrity is the key to being able to know that God will defend you. And I believe with the honest shadow of a doubt that we're about to see integrity within the people of God. I want us to keep reading here. Verse number 11 says, On that day the number of those who were killed at the citadel in Susa was reported to the king, and the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and eliminated 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman at the citadel in Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your request? It shall also be granted you, and what is your further wish? It shall also be done. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let tomorrow also be granted to the Jews who are in Susa to do according to the edict of today. Let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the wooden gallows. So here we are. We're going to make an example of the ten sons because even though Haman is dead, his sons were very much alive until now. 
And there were others who they had influence over, and so there were people still trying to kill the Jews. So as a statement, let's hang the ten sons of Haman. And it says in verse 15, the Jews who were in Susa assembled also on the 14th day of the month, uh, Adar, and killed 300 men in Susa, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Here we have these men, we have people that uh, obviously have an opportunity to go in and take whatever they desire. Their enemy has been destroyed, their enemy has been done with, and, and now we can go in and take out of these 500 people, we can go in and take whatever we want. But that wasn't the case. They're, they had done, they had defended themselves, they had, they had eradicated the issue. And also, if you keep reading, you find that they actually killed, wound up killing about 50,000, or 75,000, excuse me. And, and get this, out of those, you might think that's a big number. But it's estimated there were 50 million Persians were alive during this time. That's not that big of a number. So the question becomes, why didn't they plunder their enemies? Why didn't they go in and take what was theirs? Why didn't they go in and just completely destroy them and, and, and get whatever they wanted and then leave out? Well, I want to talk about this thing. It's, it's integrity in battle. There's this thing that we have to understand must take place, must happen as we battle in life, as people come against us. So I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. Now remember, they didn't have Romans chapter 12. Paul had not wrote this yet. Paul was not alive during this day. But this is an example of God and his people. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 19, and then verse 21. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. All right, let's just stop there. What is the most common way of dealing with our enemy? Revenge, right? Revenge. But yet the Bible is very clear. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. As a pastor, I will have you know that no one has ever said anything negative about me. <laughs> I'd like my wife to testify to that. Honey, is that true? No, she's just like, don't get me started over here. No, as a pastor, there are times that, that, that I have had my name drugged through the mud. It's, it's part of life. It's part of what you do. It's part of understanding that, that there are going to be things and people that don't care for you. You're going to say something that's going to rub somebody wrong. You're, you're going to preach a sermon that, that touches, that kind of pricks the heart, but the person doesn't want to accept that, so they get angry. These are the things that are going to happen. And, and then there are going to be times, believe it or not, that the pastor does something wrong. It's just the truth. It is the reality that, that even the preacher is going to mess up from time to time. That's where integrity comes back and the preacher goes, you know what, I was wrong in this. But We never pay back evil for evil to anyone. So believe it or not, revenge is even an issue that preachers have to be careful for. This is something that we all have to be Watchful about. This says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know what? I, I love that, that verse. You may tell you why. Because there are some people you just can't be at peace with. You're to do everything you possibly can to stay at peace. But there are some people, they just don't want to be at peace. You ever met somebody, the only time they're happy is if they're stirring the pot? And I was surprised that all y'all have met somebody like this, right? Yeah, some of y'all are looking at your spouse going, mm-hmm. So if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Now, this is not a suggestion. This is about us. This is us becoming like Christ. They cared. Remember what Jesus did when they came and they began to pluck out his beard? And they began to beat him and they began to, to take the, the cat of nine tails and rake it across his back and, and they, they put the crown of thorns on him. And, and yet the Bible says that he went like a lamb, silent before, right? He did not open his mouth. Never take your own revenge. Let me tell you what that means. Don't talk about your enemy. If 
if your integrity is what you're, if it's good integrity, you should never have to explain yourself. You, who you are, people will know and understand. They're going to know who you are. They're going to know what you're about. Our problem is we want everybody to know how good our integrity is. So we feel that we have to defend ourselves. In defending ourselves, you can speak the truth of yourself, but don't sit there and start attacking the person who's attacking you because that's revenge. And the Bible says we can't do that. We're to not have that type of lifestyle as a believer. Be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. And this is why I love this, because God's better at it than we are, okay? Y'all say that with me as a church. God is better at revenge than we are, okay? So here's what he says. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. Folks, God's better at this than we are because God's intention is not for anything other than to bring him glory. Our intention when we take it in our own hands is to hurt somebody. Like the only time we ever talk about laying hands on somebody is whenever we're mad at somebody, right? We're Baptists. We don't do it. Let me pray for you. In the name of Jesus. If you ever raised a two-year-old... <coughs> You know what it's like to sit there and go, listen, you're not going to touch that. What's the two-year-old going to do? They're going to touch it. We act like two-year-olds a lot of times when it comes to being hurt. We don't want people to talk about us, but we're going to turn around after they've talked about us and do what? Talk about them. Our integrity is intact when we trust that God is better at revenge than we are. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so finally it says this, we're going to finish up with this, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So who's talking about you? Now here, you ready? Oh, you're going to love this. I'm going to just kneel down and tell you. Because it's this good. Who's hurting you? Who's being ugly? Go wash their feet. Go love them. The Bible says to love your what? Enemy. Do good to those who hurt you. And spitefully use you. Jesus is about to be betrayed. He knows who's going to betray him, and it's Judas. And if you actually read the account in Scripture, the right side was the place of honor. Jesus placed Judas in the place of honor. He would have washed his feet. You don't like what people are doing to you, quit talking about them. Start loving them. For the time, if I talk to them, I promise, then don't talk to them. Talk to the Lord on their behalf. You don't understand, there's no hope for that person. And honestly, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. There are times I have honestly felt like, why should I pray for them? There's no hope for them. Now the real issue is within my own heart, not within the heart of my enemy any longer. Does that make sense? We overcome evil with good. Washing a person's foot was the job that was beneath most people. So in order for you to love your enemy, you've got to put yourself in the place of the servant of your enemy. Yeah, right? 
That's what it's called for in Scripture. That's what the church is, to love, to honor. You say, but brother, tell me you understand. These people are horrible. They're mean. They're, they're, they're ugly. Yeah? And we have the right to defend ourselves. Tell you what, if somebody tries to break into my house, I'm going to defend my family. I'm just telling you, that's the truth. I, that is part of my job as a, as a man is to defend my family. And if I can't get to you, I'm not overly worried about it because my wife packs too, and that's just the way it works. Uh, mm. <clears throat> we have the right to defend ourselves, but we have to defend ourselves without slander and punishment being wrought towards our enemy. By the time I don't understand, <clears throat> that's great that these people didn't plunder. It's great that they just defended themselves. They, they wiped out those who were around them that were bad. We get all that. They fought with integrity. But people make me angry. What am I supposed to do? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen race. If you're here, listen to me this morning. You are chosen to be here. If you are part of what God is doing, God has chosen you to be here. He has called you out. A royal priesthood. You have the right to go before God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. A holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me give you an illustration here. If you have people who hate you, People who talk about you, people who have ill will, uh, wishes ill will towards you. I mean, I'm angry, I'm mad, I'm all of these different things, I'm hurt. And by the way, when we're hurt, that's when we're the most dangerous, amen? It's just the truth. Like being mad is one thing, but when we're hurt, that brings a whole new feel to the whole situation. But let's say this person comes against you. Verbally, they attack you. They attack your family. They, they come after you. And everybody in your friend's group is telling you, hmm, you better put them in their place. You better stand up for yourself. You need to let other people know what they've done. How dare them talk about you? But then you get a hold of the scripture and it says that you're called out. You're different. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then you read that revenge is the Lord's, not yours. And so instead of getting back at the enemy, you take the towel and you wrap yourself with the towel and you get down with a bucket of water and you find yourself before your enemy and you wash the feet of your enemy. And some of you are going, you keep saying wash your feet. Do we literally wash the feet? What you do is you find their greatest need and you try to meet it for them. You look at what that enemy needs and you begin to try and see to it that they have what they need. That's fighting with integrity. I want to continue to go back to, to what our friend Stephen Davies shared. He says, what's so amazing about this story is not that the Jews gained mastery over their enemies, but that they gained mastery over themselves. Today, if you are here and you feel like you have been slandered or hurt, 
you've been treated wrong, people have done stuff to you, let me tell you what. You need to have mastery over yourself. How will you respond? How will you treat the one who's treating you with ill will? Some of us just need strength to respond properly. If you're one of those people, and I'm going to raise my hand because I'm one of those people. If you're one of those people who just needs strength to respond in the right way when people attack you, would you just raise your hand this morning so we can, we can see that? Man, some of you amaze me because you didn't raise your hand. I want to be like you when I grow up. Seriously, because I do. I, I find myself just wanting to, well, lay hands on people. Now, I don't do that, obviously. But there are times I'm like, you know, if somebody would just hit him hard enough. (laughs) Yeah, you are laughing, but you know it's true. Like, man, if somebody just just hit him hard enough, maybe it knocks some sense into him. Does it work? Does it work? (laughs) H.C., can you come sit by your wife? Um. Our integrity is in how we respond to the enemy, how we serve the enemy, how we love the enemy, and how we trust God with the enemy. Because would it not be awesome if in the process of you serving your enemy, loving your enemy, God brought them to a place of salvation? Would that not be awesome? It'd be good, Brother Tom, but I still want to punch him in the face. Yeah, and then you don't trust God to do a greater work than you. Maybe you're here and you've added slander to your defense. Maybe you've taken what your enemy has done to you, and in order to get back, you've slandered them. Well, they slandered me. I'll tell you. Let me tell you what I think about them. The altar is here for you today. If you're here today and you need to understand you need to learn to leave room for God's wrath, the altar is here for you today. So you need to bring everything, including your enemy, to the altar this morning. comes a point where we come down and we pray and we say, God, here's the name of the person that I am bothered by. Here's the name of the person who is hurting me, who is attacking me. And you may tell you what, can I be honest with you? Most of the time when people are being ugly to you, that tells more of a story of their own heart than it does you. They're hurting. And if you think that that person ought to know better, well, maybe they ought to know better. But that still does not give us a right to slander them just because they've slandered us. You can fight with integrity. You can defend yourself with integrity. And believe it or not, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, this recipe is there for us so that we can even love our enemy to Christ. And in the process of loving our enemy, our children watch how we respond. Our children watch how we battle with integrity. And they become different than their peers. And they learn to trust God that his wrath is greater than our anger. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know, I, I need to be a part of this church. Well, you come down. We'll be glad to talk to you about that, what that looks like, what that means. And others, maybe you've never come to a place of salvation. Let me tell you the good news The good news is this. Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except by him. And here's the beauty of that. I don't care how good you think you are. 
we have nothing to offer God. And that's okay. Because God has already taken care of everything through his son, Jesus Christ. All I have to do, the Bible says, is to believe, believe that Jesus died and rose again. Because if I believe that, that is the fulfillment of the Messiah. And I have put my faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have told us to love what the world would call the unlovable, our enemy. And you have told us, Father, to become servants. Jesus himself put Judas in a place of honor. He took and loosened the sandal straps of those dirty feet, those dirty shoes. He took a rag and he began to wash his betrayer's feet. And Father, we need to learn from that. God, we need to learn that in order for us to ever find peace with our enemy is loving them. Father, forgive me when I'm angry. God, forgive me when I've been hurt and I've returned that hurt. Lord, move within me today. Move within all of us to trust you with those who would hurt us. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand together.